to dream a little bit with you. Um, you have said some things that um, have done more than inspire me. They have um, just, you know, compelled me to dream. Uh-huh. And for me, dreaming is not, um, it's not fantasy. It, it's plotting, it's scheming, it's Harriet Tubman kind of dreaming. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's making that world, creating that world um, that we know is possible. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share back with you a couple of things that you said, and I want you to just sit with me in these, and, and I'm going to push you to tell me a little bit more. So you said oppressed people, you, you hoped that oppressed people would understand that justice is a joint effort mm. and that we would come together and create communities of allyship and support each other. And if we did, we would be unstoppable. And you sort of talked a little bit about Fred Hampton. So what does, what does that look like? What does, what does that coming together with the commitment that justice is a joint effort look like? When I say that, I think about the community of faith that I lead. We set out to create a space where we didn't target based on demographics. Mm -hmm. We we weren't concerned about your race or your age or your gender, uh, your sexual orientation, your socioeconomic status. Those are all demographics that we consider. And I come from a business banking background. Mm -hmm. So when I think ministry, I I bring my corporate marketing uh, (laughs) language to it, which Mm -hmm. is why I I talk in these terms a lot. So we decided we wanted to target people based on psychographics, Mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with demographic information, but it's about a worldview, aspirations, attitudes, Mm -hmm. and outlooks. Mm -hmm. So we organically have created this community of people that come from so many different walks of life. Mm -hmm. We have uh, people who um, come from middle class, you know, upper class, people who are struggling to make ends meet. We have uh, male, female, non-binary, everybody just kind of mixed in there, black, white, Latinx, everything. And the goal was for all of us to come together and see that we all can serve each other in some way. Mm -hmm. All of us come into this space with some form of privilege. It's very difficult to find somebody who has no privilege whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I have Mm -hmm. not found that person yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we also can recognize that we have some areas where we are oppressed. And when we come together, and I'm actually putting putting something together right now to talk about the power of allyship, when we come together and look out for each other, there's power in us looking out for each other because privileged people are more likely to listen to other privileged people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of what I say in my allyship for people in the Q plus community is not new. I'm not saying anything that's new, but I'm saying it from a position of privilege. Sure. So I don't have the same vested interest in what I'm saying that somebody in the community has. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So people listen to me a little bit more because, wait a minute, this dude's saying this stuff and he's not gay? Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. some people have such a hard time believing it that they start to insinuate that Mm -hmm. I'm gay (laughs) because they can't (laughs) can't make sense of it. It's like, he must be gay. He must. And I'm like, no, I really just believe that people have the human right. They have the right to human dignity. So. I have white gay people in my church who I will advocate for and who I will defend with everything that I have. But then those same people, when there's an issue of racial justice, Mm -hmm. they'll come to my defense in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to fight racial justice battles when when those situations arise because my white members, they they right there. Like, wait a minute, what Mm -hmm. you not gonna do? (laughs) (laughs) What's not gonna happen? Yeah. So we look out for each other in that way, and then it it allows us to um, maximize the energy that we have. Because when when you're advocating for your own humanity, it takes mm-hmm. a certain level of energy, like mm-hmm. it, it it drains you because mm-hmm. you're you're so vested in it. When you're doing ally work, there's a different level of tenacity mm-hmm. that you have because 
you're not doing so much internal work Mm -hmm. um, while advocating, like, because it's Mm -hmm. not, they're not attacking you. They're attacking somebody else that you care about. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's what I talk about just as being a joint effort, being in communities of allyship where we look out for each other Mm -hmm. instead of trying to fight by ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what I have seen this last year and a half is our willingness to sacrifice each other, Mm -hmm. to sacrifice uh, our elders, to sacrifice um, people who uh, frontline workers, uh, to sacrifice people for the economy. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just impossible for me to imagine how we could do that if we did what you said, which is you said the image of God is sacred in all of us. Right. And so I'm wondering, you know, what post pandemic, what would a world look like where the image of God is sacred in all of us really was the truth. I don't, I don't know how feasible that is in the grand scheme Mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of people to affect that kind of change. And sometimes those of us who are seeking to do justice work and um, create beloved community, mm-hmm. we get we get discouraged because we want to change the entire world. We want the whole world to get it right now by Friday yeah. at five o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, our model was Jesus, and he couldn't do it mm-hmm. in his lifetime. He got nowhere near it. It was in his death, burial, and resurrection in which we believe that his ministry was able to go further than it ever went in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And in every generation, people who fight for justice are generally fighting for something they will not see in their lifetimes. Mm. My generation. Wait, wait, wait. Let's stay right there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. But we're fighting for something that we are not going to see in our lifetime. A lot of times I believe that's the case. Um my generation enjoys the benefits um uh, that the prior generation fought for. So whatever my generation is fighting for, mm-hmm. the generations that come after us will enjoy the benefits. Mm-hmm. So I frame my my work in that way. Like I, I might not see all the results of this in this lifetime, but I'm I'm fighting for somebody else to make sure they don't have to deal with what I've dealt with, or um, or what my neighbors have dealt with as it pertains to the various isms that we face on a regular basis. So I'd love to see in a post pandemic world where we all truly see the image of God as sacred in every human being. What I commit to doing personally is making sure the spaces I curate look Mm -hmm. like that because there are too many people who are just opposed wholesale to the work that I'm doing. I I can't I can't give my energy to those people. So I want to make sure the communities I curate that they reflect that notion that the image of God is sacred in all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm shaking my head, but in, the wheels are turning in my head. I'm sure. <laughs> you, you can't see the wheels turning in my head, but I want to live in that world. Me too. Mm-hmm. I want to live in that world. I know and we that create we create our own world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We create that. I, I I felt that I experienced that um, most profoundly. You know, in when this when the the shutdown began, the lockdowns began. Um. I would wake up in the morning in tears and I would go to bed at night holding back tears. And during the day, I would have to make decisions about what I could work on Mm -hmm. because 
uh, we are traumatized and we didn't have a whole, I didn't have a whole lot of energy. And so I had to choose where I was going to put my energy, my, my emotional uh, investment. Uh, and for me, the bottom line was for the things I chose for the things that would create the tomorrow that I want to see, that I believe another world is possible. We don't have to die to see it. <laughs> but and and that discipline of having to choose with the amount of energy I had <laughs> and however many functional hours <laughs> that I had for that day, like what I was going to do. And um and so choosing um choosing to to work uh for the world that I, I absolutely believe um is possible and that is heartbreaking work. Oh yes. It's heartbreaking work. And it's lonely. And it's lonely. Yeah, it's lonely. I have to I have to remind uh, people at the faith community sometimes how unique our ministry is because we do this stuff all the time. We live mm-hmm. in this space. Mm-hmm. So the the conversations that we have um the type of worship experiences that we have, the messages that we preach, our programming in general, and just general life at TFC is very different. And sometimes we're so accustomed to it, we forget how different it is Mm -hmm. uh, from the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. Because like people look at us and think we are insane. And we just go on about our business. (laughs) You know, we just, like, what do you mean? Like, oh yeah, it is crazy to have a ministry with cigars talking about Jesus and doing it publicly. (laughs) I forgot how crazy that was because we've been doing it for so long now. It is mm-hmm. just a part of life. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, it is crazy to have, um, you know, LGBTQ plus people leading in every aspect of ministry when the leadership of the church, like the pastor is, you know, straight, male, masculine, uh, former mm-hmm. football player, you know, mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. you would think, I, you know, a pastor of this type of church wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, but this is the world that we've created. And we we lean into it. We just have to be reminded that this isn't the norm. So mm-hmm. when, when people engage it, we have to keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about lamenting into hope begins in community. That uh, in my understanding of lamenting is that we are, when, when we're clear, that the world God intended is not the world that we have. We lament (laughs) that, that when uh, we're, we see the absence of justice and, and, and grace and love, we lament. And that is the most, um, that's one of the ways that we um, uh, lament is one of the ways we demonstrate being in tune with the divine. And one of the things about um, what it means to be oppressed in these United States of America is that um, lamenting for the oppressed is sometimes a privilege uh, because feeling, mm-hmm. right? You know, the, the, the privilege to feel, mm-hmm. because how many times have you heard, don't cry? Uh right keep praying yeah yeah, I know you heard it yeah I know this is you know difficult and you don't feel like you can do it by yourself and you just keep you know pressing on the church that the the separation between the 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 reality of the state of our bodies and and what's happening you know in in this world that we don't have we don't create the privilege for people to lament and to weep and to mourn uh, um, to raise their fists, you know, even to God to say, what the hell, uh-huh. you know, that we, that it is, it is a, a privilege. And even when we are, um, you know, when, uh, one of the things that, that uh, breaks my heart as a mother, as a black mother, uh, is when another black mother has lost a child or family member to state sponsored <laughs> violence, you know, uh-huh. and they come with the, the microphones and put them in her face. And one of the first questions that they ask is about forgiveness. Can you, can you forgive? 
that you don't this this idea that we're not we're not allowed even to feel the full range of human emotion. So how? And so if lamenting into hope begins in community, how do we encourage people to create communities? We need communities, right? Uh How, how, How do we get, because this is, American Christianity is often reduced to uh, faith in the gospel being like this private transaction between, you know, me and God. I don't need anybody. It's, right. it's just us, right? right? And But what you're saying is that no, feeling, lamenting, hope, right, all that, like it begins in community. And how do we raise that antidote to this thing that we live with every day, um, this Americanized faith? Yeah. I go to science, uh, just, mm-hmm. I believe, I believe scripture and science go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, I know there's been so much debate, especially when I was younger and I would hear like, you know, all the debate about evolution versus the creation narrative and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, you know, but then growing up to understand how genre plays into scripture, yeah. right? Like <laughs> understanding what allegory is and, stories and folklore how all of that poetry all of that is found within the scriptures uh so i look at science from a psychological perspective understanding how important relationship is Mm -hmm. to our sanity right like if we don't have human interaction we cannot maintain our sanity. That's why, and that's something I pull from Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the study of psychology. Mm -hmm. We see that in the scriptures. Like in the beginning, God created all of this stuff. (laughs) Everything that God created, God said it was good. Mm -hmm. Except for one thing. Mm -hmm. God said everything was good, except for one thing. God looked at all the creation and in this particular creation narrative, looked at the human that was alone mm. and said, that's not good. It's not good that the human is alone. Which means just having interaction with the divine isn't enough because the Adam had God mm-hmm. and it still wasn't enough. He said, it's not good that the human be alone. So then God creates a companion. And at that point, it's all good, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which which shows us that even the writers of the ancient scripture understood the need for human connection without having all of these studies of psychology and, you know, understanding how the brain works from a scientific perspective. They still understood we needed human connection and that Mm -hmm. our connection to God in many ways was lived out in our connection to other people. So when we look at science. Maslow's hierarchy of needs says our base level needs as human beings are food, water, shelter, security. We need those things for survival. Mm -hmm. The very next level of needs that we have psychologically are companionship and relationship. Before we can really focus on our career self-actualization, making money, our purpose, all of that. (laughs) We need relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anything that we do, anything that we take seriously, at some point in that journey, it's important for us to uh, prioritize relationships in what we do. There are, you know, in the many things that 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 I do, there's something about having relationship with people who are on the same journey that, that I'm on. Mm-hmm. As as a clothier, I love having relationships with other clothiers who are doing the same work and, mm-hmm. and experiencing some of the same challenges and struggles. Mm-hmm. And then we can vent with each other because mm-hmm. we understand each other. Like, don't you hate when you get that one client? <laughs> yeah, hey, man, I was, the same thing happened to me. I hate when they do that. And then we start sharing ideas about, well, mm-hmm. here's, here's how I dealt with that. Oh, that's a good idea. Right? As people of faith, we come together in community around our shared faith. 
understanding that we're on the same journey. And sometimes our journey will take different paths, but we're still going in the same direction. And then bounce stuff off of each other. Mm-hmm. And we, we learn from each other and we grow with each other. The Bible says, how can two walk unless, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? And mm-hmm. a, a lot of times that, that verse is so taken out of context mm-hmm. because uh, a lot of church people will say, you got to agree with me if we're going to walk together. When the text is literally saying, how can two people walk together unless they agree mm-hmm. to walk together? To walk together. It, mm-hmm. it, it's not saying we have to agree on everything while we walk. It just means that regardless of what happens on this journey, we agree we're walking walk. together. Yeah. So yeah. as we lament, we agree to lament together. We agree to lean into hope together. We agree to do justice together. Mm-hmm. We agree to live our greatest commandment together. We agree to, like, we commit to loving ourselves together. Mm-hmm. And I just believe that anything that we do in life, it's better when we have a communal component. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean everything has to be done in community, but when there's a communal component, regardless of what we do, your profession, your faith, your hobbies, your weight loss journey, whatever it is, <laughs> there's there's a communal component that only enhances it. So mm-hmm. I, I just apply that as well to our faith journeys. Mm-hmm. You you I'm I'm so grateful for what you've just shared. Um, um, when I think about uh, the United States of America and the fact that we are uh, a fragile democracy. Some folks say failed democracy, right? Um, but certainly uh, fragile. Um, because if we are to be a true democracy, we must be multi-faith. We must be multiracial, multi-ethnic. We cannot, um, this is not a Christian nation. It right. has to be. It has to be um, multi. And what you've inspired me to see is maybe how that can be is if we agree to walk together, agree <laughs> if to walk. we agree to journey together, not that we have to agree, but just that we, if we agree to do it together. Right. And, and on the journey, let's figure out where we're going. Like, what are we trying to accomplish? Because if One of us is trying to accomplish beloved community. And the other one simply wants to have the biggest ministry possible. Mm -hmm. Then we're not on the same Mm -hmm. journey Mm -hmm. and we can't walk together Mm -hmm. because we're Mm -hmm. not going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So we have to identify where we're going. And And a lot of times when I have conversations with people, They assume, because I'm a Christian pastor, that we start from the same place and we got the same destination in mind. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, like, I don't, I'm I'm on a different wave, totally. Mm -hmm. Like, you're starting this conversation with basic assumptions that I don't share. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so... My definition of love is different than yours. My definition of sin is different than yours. The way I relate to the Bible is different from the way you relate. The way I see God is different. Like, let's first establish where we stand on these issues before we start trying to get into all the weeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like we have to know from where we are starting and where we're going. Mm -hmm. And at the faith community, we all agree on that. We all agree. (laughs) The core of everything is the greatest commandment. Jesus said it. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment in all the law? He said, love God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything in the law and everything in the prophets hinge on these two. And I know I'm sure I said this the last time we spoke, but I just Mm -hmm. can't stop saying it because it is the core of everything that I do in ministry. If everything hinges on love for God and love for neighbor as self, you can't separate the two. So in everything that we do, we all agree that whatever the issue is, we're going to come back to the question, how does the greatest commandment apply here? Mm -hmm. 
and we may we may disagree about some of the particulars, but mm -hmm. how does the greatest commandment apply here? Are we loving ourselves? Are we loving our neighbors? Because if we are, that is the manifestation of our love for God. Yeah. And I just believe that when we get together and do that in community, it just works out so much better. <laughs> really?